brought to you by NRDC. You're listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on Somerville Community Access Television or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So I'm going to start this seg- this show off with a segment I like to call What's Topping the Box Office. This is a rundown of the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. And last week, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle was knocked out of the number one spot by Maze Runner The Death Cure for the first time in three weeks. This week, something phenomenal happened. Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle is number one at the box office again, although it may this may be its last week at number one especially considering the big films that are coming out in the next coming weeks, including, unfortunately, Fifty Shades Free, a movie that I, unfortunately, will also see and review for you next week. But more on that later. Anyway, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle earns $10.9 million this past weekend. Against a budget ranging from 90 to $110 million, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle has so far earned $352.6 million in the States and $800... $857.6 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world by quite a bit. Maze Runner, The Death Cure, was number one when it debuted last week. This week is number two, grossing just slightly less than Jumaji did at $10.5 million. Against a budget of $62 million, though, Maze Runner, The Death Cure, the third in the Maze Runner series, has earned $40 million even here in the States and $183.2 million worldwide. So I don't know what the appeal of Maze Runner is internationally. It may be different to other people of other countries countries, but it is not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit, although not nearly as much of a certified hit as Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle, but a certified hit nonetheless. Winchester is the highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it is number three at the box office, having earned $9.3 million. So I don't have the information on the budget of this movie or how well it did overseas, so I cannot tell you whether it's any kind of hit if it is a hit. So moving on. The Greatest Showman, two weeks ago was number five at the box office, last week was number four at the box office, this week it's number four, again, having grossed $7.7 million. So The Greatest Showman hasn't earned as much money as Star Wars The Last Jedi or Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle, but it's still doing really well for itself. Against a budget of $84 million, The Greatest Showman has so far earned $137.4 million here in the States and $290.5 million dollars worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit. It may inch its way to being a certified hit here in the States, but it's going to take a while for that to happen. The Post is number five at the box office this weekend, having made $5.2 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $50 million, The Post has so far earned $67.2 million here in the States and $107.4 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit worldwide. Hostels, starring Christian Bale, is number six at the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week, having earned $5.1 million. However, it being kept away from the national, and for that matter, international box office, probably hurts chances of becoming a hit of any kind, at least here in the States, because against a budget of... 39 to 50 million dollars somewhere in that range hostels has only earned 20.8 million dollars here in the states and it has earned 21.9 million dollars worldwide so it's making the bulk of its money here in the states but it's still not enough because it's not a hit yet here in the states or around the world 
12 Strong is number 7 at the box office this weekend, sliding just slightly from number 6 last week, having earned $4.7 million this past weekend in the States. Against a budget of $35 million, 12 Strong has so far earned $37.3 million here in the States and $46 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit both here in the States and around the world. It could be a certified hit in both cases, but... Right now, it's not looking particularly strong for 12 Strong. But at number 8 at the box office is Den of Thieves, which is around the same kind of level as 12 Strong in terms of box office gross. This week it earned $4.6 million, which is approximately $100,000 less than 12 Strong gross this weekend alone. Against a budget of $30 million, Den of Thieves has so far grossed $36.2 million here in the States and $45.4 million worldwide. So Den of Thieves has made more bang for its buck than 12 strong but it is still a tentative hit like 12 strong here in the states and around the world Number nine of the box office this weekend, sliding from number eight last week, is The Shape of Water. Now, The Shape of Water, like The Post, has been buoyed by its Oscar nominations, but it's still kind of struggling there, surprisingly, having earned $4.4 million at the box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $19.5 million, though, The Shape of Water has so far earned $44.7 million here in the States and $64.2 million worldwide. Worldwide. So even though it doesn't sound like a lot, against a budget of $19.5 million, The Shape of Water is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And we'll probably be seeing a little bit more of it, especially since o- Oscar season is here. And finally, Paddington 2 is number 10 at the box office this this past weekend, having earned $3.3 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $50 million, that's $50 million, Paddington 2 has so far earned excuse me, $36.5 million here in the States and $196.1 million worldwide. So Paddington 2 has been getting great reviews, almost as good as the original Paddington from three years ago. <clears throat> However, it's not surprisingly a hit here in the States, and judging from the fact that we have the Fifty Shades Freed movie coming next weekend, and of course the Black Panther movie coming the weekend after that, it's unlikely we'll see Paddington 2 in the top 10 next week, but That being said, even though it's not a hit yet here in the States, around the world it is fortunately a certified hit. But when you think about it, Paddington Bear has a lot more international appeal than it does in the United States, considering that the character of Paddington Bear, I've explained it already. I didn't talk for a long time. I was sensitive to lights and sounds, so I built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. Sometimes I do the same things over and over. Until one day, I found out I had autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is really one of the only new movies to open this past weekend there wasn't a lot there weren't a lot of options out there and that movie is Winchester and it is a supernatural horror film directed by the Spurig brothers Michael and Peter Spurig and I don't I'm actually looking up right now that they are German directors and I hope I pronounce their names correctly because yeah they've been writing, producing, and directing films for quite some time. They debuted in 2003, at least their feature film debut, with one called Undead, which i got to be honest with you, I haven't seen. And they actually directed Jigsaw, which came out a couple of months ago. And Jigsaw, I thought, was adequate. It certainly had its 
interesting moments, but Winchester is very much like Undead and Jigsaw, just to name a few of the movies they've done. Another addition to their horror film roster. And this is a movie that's allegedly based on a true story, although with a horror film like this, you have to take the inspired by a true story moniker with a grain of salt. But there is a real Winchester mansion in San Jose, California, and there was a woman named Sarah Winchester who claimed that the mansion was haunted when she lived inside there in 1906. And that's where the bulk of the movie takes place. It it actually doesn't give a specific date, but you can definitely tell from the fact that they use telephones and they still use horse-drawn carriages, and there is a big earthquake that happens in the movie. That's not a spoiler alert. It does happen at the end, but that's not the most surprising thing to happen in the film. You can definitely tell that it's in that time period, but it would have helped if they had told us in the beginning that it took place in 1906. But the primary protagonist in this film is Dr. Eric Price, who's played in this movie by Jason Clark. And Dr. Price is a psychologist who is commissioned to go to the Winchester Mansion to analyze the mental health, or lack thereof, allegedly, of the aforementioned Sarah Winchester, who not only lives inside the mansion, but also wears a black veil pretty much anywhere she goes. Now, this could be considered a creepy characteristic, but which it is, but once Helen Mirren, who plays Sarah Winchester, takes off the veil, there's really nothing especially creepy about her personality, even though she is able to sense supernatural spirits in the house. So one of the things I liked about Winchester was the set design. Even though they didn't tell you in the very beginning that it took place in 1906, you could definitely tell there was some great attention to detail, not only in the costumes, but also, as I said, in the set design. I could almost smell the the mustiness of the mansion as I was watching the film, even though I was in a relatively clean theater when I was watching it in an AMC theater. But regardless... The set design and costumes are really great, and if this movie didn't come out during the January-February Oscar season, I would have maybe contended it or recommended it as a contender for an Oscar nomination in those categories, but 12 months from now, that is, you know, 10 to 12 months from now, it's probably going to be forgotten. And the reason it's going to be forgotten is, other than the fact that it has those great assets, and you have he- Helen Mirren and other great actors, even Jason Clark was is a really good actor as well, the rest of it is largely forgettable. I thought there were some decent jump scares in the movie, as you might expect it being a supernatural horror film. But for a movie with its movie poster looking so creepy with just Helen Mirren's face staring right at you beneath a black veil. It's just kind of a standard run-of-the-mill horror film. And even the the twist in, in the end with who's haunting the mansion and why is just so-so. As a matter of fact, this movie gets dragged in terms of its pacing because of its exposition, which the characters in the film feel, or rather the people who wrote the film, including the Spirit Brothers, felt could be best explained by just two characters talking. And there's not a lot that's shown during this movie, which breaks that storytelling rule of show, don't tell. There's a lot of telling, especially in the first 30 to 45 minutes of this 100-minute film, but not a lot of showing. And the, the parts where they really start to show you are when the ghosts actually start haunting the Winchester. And as I said, once you actually meet the spirit and you realize his motivation in the living world, and then the spirit comes back to haunt the Winchester mansion, that's when things start to get interesting. And there were some jump scares in this movie that made me flinch. But overall, Winchester was very run-of-the-mill. And the fact that they told you at the very end of the movie that there is a Winchester mansion, and it's, and it's reputed as being the most haunted mansion in the United States, 
didn't really make me appreciate this film anymore. I, I didn't think it was exploitation, but I, I also didn't especially find that fact interesting. If you want me to find a, a true story about a haunted mansion interesting, make a documentary. Don't make a fictional film that feels fake. And that's exactly what Winchester is, unfortunately. So even though you have great actors in this movie like Helen Mirren and Jason Clark, and a really eerily creepy poster, and remember, I don't watch movie previews, so I couldn't tell you what the previews are like, but the, the poster had me hooked. But unfortunately, it's there's just not a lot there. So when a movie comes out, particularly a horror film, around January or February, I can almost guarantee that it can be relatively uninteresting, and Winchester is overall a very forgettable film. I don't even think Helen Mirren looked like she was having fun when she was making it. And I would say, what would Helen? what is Helen Mirren doing in a movie like this? But then again, Helen Mirren was also in Caligula, which was early in her career, yes, but that was also a mess of a movie. Winchester is a better movie than Caligula, but that's not saying a lot. It is a strikeout in my book. It is a movie that comes off as dark and dreary, but ends up being dull. And you're also not you're also not told or really given any understanding why the mansion is still haunted and why there are other ghosts in it. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. <laughs> Never Stop the Madness, Tuesdays at 9 p.m., bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is one I actually saw a few weeks ago, but now I actually have time to review it, especially given the fact that it's nominated for six Academy Awards, and I'll tell you what those nominations are in just a few moments. The movie is Phantom Thread. It's directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, and it stars Daniel Day-Lewis, Leslie Manville, and Vicky... I want to say her last name is pronounced Cripes. It's K-R-I-E-P-S. Cryeps. I'm, I'm going to pronounce it Cryeps because I don't actually know how it's pronounced. But it is a movie that has been nominated for six Academy Awards, including Best Performance by an Actor in a Leading Role, Daniel Day-Lewis, Best Performance by an Actress in a Supporting Role, Leslie Manville. Best achieve, best Original Score, I should say. That's the short ver way of saying it. Johnny Greenwood. Best Achievement in Costume Design, Mark Bridges. Best Achievement in Directing, Paul Thomas Anderson. And last but not least, Best Movie of the Year. And it was nominated for actually only two Golden Globes. This is kind of ironic because I would have expected it to have been nominated maybe for more Golden Globes. But for Golden Globes, it was nominated nominated for but didn't win best original score and best performance by a lead actor daniel day lewis so this is a movie that is very much unlike a lot of paul thomas anderson's previous films especially when you compare it to hard eight boogie nights even the the one that Daniel Day Lewis starred in before in and it's hard to believe it's been ten years since the movie was made there will be blood because Phantom Thread is not a particular movie that tells a story as Paul Thomas Anderson likes to do particularly with a large cast although that those are more of his um, late nineties films like Boogie Nights and Magnolia but Phantom Thread is more of a character study but I do have to say that it's its nomination for Best Achievement in Costume Design is very well deserved because this takes place in London's, I want to say, fashion world in the 1950s. It's described in some websites as London's 
Couture World. I hope I'm pronouncing that word correctly. C-O-U-T-U-R-E. If I'm not pronouncing it correctly, please forgive my ignorance. But Daniel Day-Lewis is a dressmaker in this movie, living with his sister, played by Leslie Manville. And Daniel Day-Lewis's character is very committed to his work, but he's also very particular about his work and leisure habits and that comes into conflict when he falls in love with a young waitress who's played by actress Vicky Kriaps and the couple's relationship vacillates between affection and distance until they finally learn to live with one another's differences that is the film in a nutshell and this is reputed to be Daniel Day-Lewis's final film role before entering retirement but He also said he would retire from movies 15 years ago, so you got to take that as what it is. He's he's probably not going to be in permanent retirement, but either way, if this is his final role, and for the record, I hope it isn't because Daniel Day-Lewis is a, a great actor, and I can't think of a one single bad movie he was in, or at least one in which he didn't act well. As a matter of fact, I don't think he's been in a bad movie to date. I mean, he's very much... I, I could bring up other actors, but I, I can't think of any at, at the moment. But if this is his final curtain call, then... I think it's actually a a fitting end to his acting career, but let's just not say that it's (laughs) that it's the end yet. It's the end for now, but maybe not forever. But this movie, even though it's more of a slower burn than Paul Thomas Anderson usually directs, it's still a movie that's fascinating for its character study. It actually delves into these characters and what they do on a day-to-day basis and how this fashion designer, this very picky fashion designer, as well as this former waitress, live with one another once they fall in love and get married. And there are some iconic scenes in this film, particularly when Daniel Day-Lewis's character, and I I should give him a name because I I know he has a name. Let me just look that up. Yeah. His, His name in the movie is Reynolds Woodcock. So anyway, that's probably not a a name I will repeat again and again, but once you realize, once you see how meticulous he is when it comes to his designing dresses and also how he treats those people around him, including his his sister, who seems to tame him a lot more than other people, you, you begin to get a great sense of what these what these characters' day-to-day lives are like and how they adapt to one another. And I think it's a really fascinating process. This is a movie that I did see in 70 millimeter, and the, the movies that I've seen in 70 millimeter previously have included The Hateful Eight from director Quentin Tarantino and probably most recently the latest from the, the latest movie from Christopher Nolan, Dunkirk. So what those two movies had in common were that they were action films, whereas Phantom Thread, it, there's not a lot of action happening here. But seeing it in 70 millimeter is something I would recommend you do if you get the chance because this movie really looks bright and very, it looks great in 70 millimeter. And I, I think it's a testament to how much of a film comes to life when you see it in 70 millimeter. So I recommend it if you if you get the chance. But Phantom Thread is a movie that probably tests a lot of people's patience. It's it might not be for the people who usually attend the uh, the. A- action movies at multiplexes but it is a very high quality film and it's a it's a movie to which i give my rating of a knockout if i had the time and maybe if i had prepared a little bit more f- before the show i would probably list daniel day lewis's performances from best to least best because again i've never seen him in a bad movie but if you were to meticulously rank his best performances this one may not be his very best but it would probably 
probably be in the top five. And he certainly shows his dedication, as do the other actors in this film. Man, do I love card night. You ready, boys? You got a king? Go, fish that. Oh, come on. <laughs> this is WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. My name is Miss Nelson. My name is Bruce. And we've made a wild and wonderful record for you. We will tell you all kinds of things to do and be, and you can let your imagination go with us. Just listen to what we say, dear hearts. This is where the magic starts. Radio Scopia, Fridays, 5 to 7 p.m., only on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Molly's Game. This is a movie that did not do especially well at the box office. It's still in a couple of theaters nationwide, including some in Boston, but you'd be hard-pressed probably to find it in the first movie theater you look for, especially if that movie theater has 10 screens or less. Either way, if you get a chance to check it out, I do recommend recommend it. It's a movie that stars Jessica Chastain and Idris Elba, amongst other actors. It is based on the memoir Molly's Game from Hollywood's Elite to Wall Street's Billionaire Boys Club, My High Stakes Adventure in the World of Underground Poker by Real Life former Olympian Molly Bloom, and it is written by and directed by Aaron Sorkin. Now, if you know anything about Aaron Sorkin, you know he's written several great screenplays for movies like A Few Good Men and The Social Network and TV shows like The West Wing, just to name a few. But he has never directed a movie until now. And I have to say that even though Molly's Game can be a little bit <clears throat> too bombastic particularly in the characters' dialogues, as some Aaron Sorkin films tend to be, it's Aaron Sorkin does really well directing this film. And as a matter of fact, I read in some trivia on some website that Kevin Costner, who co-stars in this movie, actually helped Aaron Sorkin with, with some d directorial advice, particularly because Kevin Costner himself is an Academy Award-winning director, having directed Dances with Wolves in 1990. Now, a little bit of a digression. I think Martin Scorsese should have won for Goodfellas in 1990. But getting back to topic. So Molly's Game is about Molly Bloom, who is a real-life person. And in this movie, she's played by Jessica Chastain. And... She's actually around the same age as Jessica Chastain, just actually a little younger. But anyway, Molly Bloom's claim to fame is that she was a world-class mogul skier with Olympic aspirations. However, uh, in a qualifying event for the 2002 Winter Olympics, she is severely injured, ending her career. So she botches her plans to attend law school and ends up taking a year off, or planning to take a year off, and moves to L.A. And eventually she works as an assistant for a movie producer before sitting in on that movie producer's underground poker games. And from then on, Molly Bloom begins to run her own underground poker games. And by underground, I mean illegal. Basically, she is running a high-stakes poker operation and it's of course illegal to do so unless you have a license for that kind of thing but of course many people don't it's just the ones who get caught or the ones who get charged so this movie has a lot of smart characters and typical of Aaron Sorkin movies they say very intelligent things a mile a minute sometimes it can you can get a little bit of a whiplash listening to these people go on and on but it is typical Aaron Sorkin I, I do have to say that Aaron Sorkin is a very smart writer and not only does he have sharp as attack dialogue maybe even sharp as a sword dialogue but he also knows how to tell a story 
That being said, sometimes his his dialogue can be a little bit too smart in the sense that all the characters in the film sometimes feel like they're speaking the same way, using the same kind of cadences, and it just doesn't really sound authentic. Sometimes Molly's game falls into this trap the same way that The Social Network did, but overall it is an engrossing film, and even though you don't... I'm a, I'm a person who doesn't know how to play poker, or I know the very basic rules. So some of the other side rules that are elaborated upon in this film kind of flew over my head, it, it, particularly the, the, well, the, the, there is some poker jargon in this film that might not, that people who are novices of poker like I am may not get. But I think that's more than made up for not only with the great dialogue, but also a lot of the great side characters that populate this film, including ones played by Michael Sarah, Brian Darcy James, the who was who is really good, albeit understated in the movie Spotlight. Basically, Brian Darcy James was the reporter in Spotlight who was not Michael Keaton, Mark Ruffalo, or Rachel McAdams. He was the other guy, but still, he did well in that film. He does really well in this film, too. He's actually kind of funny, as is Chris O'Dowd, Bill Camp, and Graham Greene, amongst other people. So this movie is about Molly Bloom, a little bit about her background, including her aspirations to be in the Winter Olympics, and also her arrest and also her being in the process of defending herself with her uh, attorney played by Idris Elba. And I thought that Jessica Chastain in this film, even though she was not nominated for an Academy Award, I think this is actually her best film since Zero Dark Thirty. A film for which she was nominated for an Academy Award, should have won, but didn't. But again, I'm, I'm getting sidelined with my woulda, coulda, shoulda talk, particularly when it comes to Academy Award nominations and winners. But the, Molly's Game has been nominated for one Academy Award, which I think is deserved. Again, there's that weakness I, I previously noted about Aaron Sorkin's characters all sounding the same, but it is a decently adapted screenplay by Aaron Sorkin, probably even greater than decent. And I th I think that Aaron Sorkin took his own liberties, his certainly his own artistic liberties when it came to adapting this book but I, I think he did pretty well again he just kind of fell into the Aaron Sorkin trap but then again Molly's Game is a film that is worth watching I think it might be a little too smart for some moviegoers but again I enjoyed watching it I think it's a movie I'll probably see again if only to pick up some some pointers when it comes to playing poker but Jessica Chastain shined in this film I absolutely loved her she and Idris Elba played very well off each other and it's a movie to which I give my rating of a knockout would I take this movie and put it in my top 10 probably not but I do think it is worth watching it's a very smart film and I enjoyed it quite a bit 180 over 111 and I had a stroke I couldn't speak or walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. You're listening to the best local tunes and talk around, only on bostonfreeradio.com. This is Alan Patterson, and I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras in many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, 
old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one I saw back in December, but I didn't get around to reviewing it until now. That movie is Pitch Perfect 3, which is a 2017 American musical comedy film directed this time by Trish Sai. Uh, her last name is, is spelled S-I-E, so I'm just going to say that it, it's pronounced Sai. And this is her first time directing a Pitch Perfect movie. The last film she filmed or she directed before this was Step Up All In. And I haven't seen any of the Step Up movies, including the original one with... Channing Tatum. I think that was when I was in my hating Channing Tatum stage. I've since gotten over that. But anyway, Pitch Perfect 3 is a movie that is, of course, the sequel to the last two Pitch Perfect movies. I didn't even need to say that. That was kind of stupid. But I'm kind of running (laughs) sort of my own synopsis here. But And the point I was getting, it being the third Pitch Perfect movie, is... It probably should be the last. I, I said in in my synopsis of the movie before I went to see it that I think they might be overextending this, especially since all the Bellas, the, the Barton Bellas, have graduated college by now. But this movie takes place three years after the events of Pitch Perfect 2, so all the Bellas are college graduates, but they are in jobs in which they all hate. So... Desperate to see each other again to sing once more, the usual suspects, including Becca, played by Anna Kendrick, Fat Amy, played by Rebel Wilson, Chloe, played by Brittany Snow, Aubrey, played by Anna Camp, and many of the other Bellas, whom I won't name, reunite for what they think is going to be a reunion in which they sing, but the only Bella who is still in college, Emily, played by Haley Steinfeld, disappoints them by having the current Bellas who are in college sing at this event, not the previous alumnus. So the the movie goes on from there with the women wanting to sing one more time, and the the father of Aubrey, Anna Camp's character, commissions them to actually sing on a USO tour along with other musicians who actually have instruments. In other words, these the, these Bellas are the only the, the Bellas are the only group that don't have any instruments, as if being an a cappella group is this new thing. And even though the Pitch Perfect movies have done actually quite a bit for a cappella groups around the country in general, including some in college. Let me put it to you this way. Before the movie Pitch Perfect came out, I think college a cappella groups were seen more as sort of a, a fading gr- group or a, a fading activity. It was the same way that. <laughs> The, the way that fraternities were, were seen as fading before Animal House came out. Uh, in fact, I think fraternities were more on the brink of extinction when Animal House came out than a cappella groups were when Pitch Perfect came out. But either way, the Pitch Perfect movies have done a lot for a cappella groups, not only in college, but also ones that, <laughs> that, that go on tour regularly, like Straight No Chaser and other such groups, other such new a cappella groups. So the fact that there is an a cappella group on this USO tour shouldn't be as novel in this movie as it would be in real life, but either way it's it's treated that way with a lot of the groups with instruments giving these Bellas the cold shoulder. That's just one of the subplots in this film. The other subplots are ones that are a little bit more 
unpredictable, or at least in terms of how they turn out. For instance, there's the the father of Fat Amy, who is an Australian, played by John Lithgow, who's not Australian, but does a pretty bad Australian accent, as if you couldn't find another Australian to play Rebel Wilson's father. And there's, of course, the subject of Fat Amy's father's estrangement from her and th- th- that sort of predictable fare. And there's also the subplot with Aubrey not being able to see her dad. And once they make their final performance and she still doesn't see her dad, you know something's going to happen at the end credits. And I think probably the most interesting subplot was Becca. Anna Kendrick's character who quit her job as a producer and is still trying to find a a music gig and then eventually wins the attention of DJ Khaled who plays himself in this film and that that subplot was actually well and good because other movies have treated the subplot with in a, a different way particularly with that tired trope of One of the members of the group hits it big time and forgets her other, her other team members and also gets the, her reputation to her head. And maybe I'm spoiling a little bit something here, but Pitch Perfect 3 didn't quite do that. However, I do feel like Pitch Perfect 3 wasn't nearly as good as the first two Pitch Perfect films. And I think they could have actually had a Pitch Perfect 3 to focus on the Bellas who are actually still at college in the fictional Barton and not the alumna the alumni who come to visit them. As a matter of fact, if they were to do that kind of angle with the graduated Barton Bellas, they could have had it so they actually get together and try to get a recording contract. Because it's not unheard of in this day and age, especially with acapella groups like Straight No Chaser and I'm blanking on other acapella groups right now I, sh- I should have probably written this down but in other words there are high profile acapella groups that are doing really well in large part because of pitch perfect so if if pitch perfect doesn't want to acknowledge in its movie universe how influential the film was that makes sense but again it has to be tapped into that sort of reality so pitch perfect 3 is not a bad film but i do think this should be the last of the pitch perfect movies i do think that anna kendrick rebel wilson and the rest of the girls if they know what's best for them should probably turn down the opportunity to make a pitch perfect 4 unless the plot is really good and this one was just sort of mediocre and john michael higgins and and Elizabeth Banks in this movie, what were they doing there? So Pitch Perfect 3 gets my rating of a checkout, but the next one, if they make a Pitch Perfect 4, is probably going to be a strikeout. At least I'm predicting. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. I love those real six sides. The ones that move me. A thinly blow. New rocky toe. Yaddle, 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 Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is Loving Vincent. Loving Vincent is a fully animated film that has actually been nominated for an Oscar for Best Feature-Length Animated Film. It's probably not going to win, particularly against Coco, but it is visually stunning and arresting. It's a movie that is depicted in oil-painted animation, which you really really have to see to believe. Watching this movie is like watching several Vincent Van Gogh paintings come to life authentically. And it's a movie about a young man who comes 
to the last hometown of painter Vincent Van Gogh, the town where Van Gogh committed suicide, to deliver the troubled artist's final letter and ends up investigating his final days there. So the movie is directed by Doroto Kobiela and Hugh Welchman and is a co-production of British and Polish filmmakers and and film film companies. So the movie even though it takes place in France is actually completely in English with British actors playing the these characters. And it's a movie about a postman by the name of Joseph Rulin who actually is a person who did exist who asks his son Armand to who's who's also somebody who actually existed to deliver Van Gogh's last letter to his brother, Theo Van Gogh, after previous attempts to mail the letter had failed. So despite not having been fond of Van Gogh and recalling the incident where, when the deceased mutilated his ear and gave it to a local prostitute, Armand reluctantly accepts due to his father's affection for the painter. And so from here on out, Armand Rulin begins to talk to people who actually knew Vincent Van Gogh and pieces together his life, particularly his last remaining days. As a matter of fact, Armand is aware of the the story that Vincent Van Gogh killed himself, but he's still not entirely convinced that that's what actually happened. And people who have... A, a, a basic understanding of Vincent Van Gogh, but may not know the whole story of Vincent Van Gogh, will certainly learn a lot from this movie. There are things that I didn't know about Vincent Van Gogh while watching this film. I'm certainly familiar with a number of his paintings, including probably most notably Starry Night. But one of the things I didn't know was that Vincent Van Gogh did not actually pick up a paintbrush until he was... 28 years old. And so he spent the last eight years of his life fervishly painting. Although, granted, he wasn't successful during his lifetime at painting. Of the 800 paintings he did paint, he only sold one of them during his lifetime, which is ironic because his paintings now, the ones that have survived, especially Starry Night, are worth millions. And Watching this film, not only do you get an appreciation of Van Gogh's art, as you should, but the film looks like a painting come to life, which is the precise idea of the movie. And the movie took 65,000 frames of oil painting on canvas to make. And, of course, Van Gogh's techniques were used by a team of 125 painters. So this movie is unfortunately one that not a lot of people have seen. It did open in very limited release on September 22nd of last year, 2017. But even I, who pays very close attention to what's in theaters, missed this one. I, it, I know it debuted at Telluride, but it is a beautiful film and one that actually reminded me storytelling-wise, of Citizen Kane, particularly where the main subject of the movie has died and one particular protagonist, who we know less about, ironically enough, wants to know more about the circumstances surrounding the main, the main subject's death. So that, that's certainly a storytelling technique derived probably most notably from Citizen Kane. I'm not sure if Citizen Kane is the first movie to have implored that or used that storytelling technique, but it's certainly the most famous example of it. But the animation style, besides the oil painting with the 65,000 frames, also reminded me a lot of the the movie Waking Life, which came out in 2001 and was directed by Richard Linklater. This is another movie that used some very bizarre motion capture animation, but even though it's bizarre, it certainly was very uh, appealing, <laughs> particularly as you're watching it. And it's also a movie that Waking Life is about subjects that would otherwise seem very dry but are are given certainly a lot of fluidity thanks to the the animation and loving vincent i don't think told 
a, a particularly dry story because Vincent Van Gogh was a fascinating character, and he certainly had a multifaceted personality that I don't think the world has particularly grasped just yet. And they may never grasp it. In fact, various sides of Vincent Van Gogh's personality, not just his depression and not just his alleged insanity, are foret- or told in this film from various perspectives. So in terms of people who act in this movie, there aren't a lot of familiar faces, although the familiar faces you see in this movie are certainly ones you recognize, even though the they're animated and in fact this this movie does use in addition to oil painting on canvas a very creative motion capture animation so you're able to identify Saoirse Ronan and Chris O'Dowd probably most notably but I love this film I thought the acting was great the animation was amazing and if there's any movie to upset Coco for best full-length animated feature at this year's Oscars, I think Loving Vincent would be it. And if a movie like Ferdinand or Boss Baby beats either of these movies, I'm going to tell you, as a moviegoer, as a movie fan, I will be pissed. But Loving Vincent is a movie you should definitely check out, and I give it my rating of a knockout. It's a movie that was only made for $5.5 million, but even in its limited run, it's grossed $30.2 million. It should have grossed a lot more than that still, but if you get a chance, definitely check it out. My name is Lola Silvestri, and I'm going to be 95 this year. I was very independent. I fell, and I had to have meals on wheels. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. This message brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm going to be ending the show with my segment, What's Coming Out Next? These are the most noteworthy films that are coming out in theaters this coming weekend. And just in time for Valentine's Day, the big movie that's going to be opening this weekend is Fifty Shades Freed. Now, it's just in time for Valentine's Day, but this is a film I'm not looking forward to seeing but I will see it. So Anastasia and Christian in this movie get married, but Jack Hyde continues to threaten their relationship. I forgot who Jack Hyde was. I'm not looking forward to seeing this movie. I I do have to say that I was actually a little bit more impressed with Fifty Shades Darker than I was with Fifty Shades of Grey, but Fifty Shades Darker was still a bad film. However, unlike Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades Darker was actually sexy. I don't anticipate Fifty Shades Free will be any improvement over on the Fifty Shades movie. In fact, I think that Dakota Johnson particularly should just move on. And I think she will after this film has made, is made and has made a boatload of money. But Fifty Shades Free is a movie I will see for next week's show, and I'll let you know how it is, and even though I like to keep an open mind about films, I could probably tell you that this movie is going to be bad. (laughs) Just based on the two other Fifty Shades movies that I have reluctantly gone to see. So the other movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is the 1517 to Paris. And this is a movie about three Americans who discover a terrorist plot aboard a train while in France. This is, of course, based on a true story. It's directed by Clint Eastwood and stars Jenna Fisher, Judy Greer, Thomas Lennon, and Lillian Solange Bowden. So I don't know the the whole story about this 1517 to Paris. I don't think it's about one of the terrorist attacks that 
actually, if you want to call it, succeeded, or the, the one that went off, unfortunately, without a hitch. There have been several of them. But this is a movie that I'm definitely curious about, and director Clint Eastwood, for being as old as he is and still directing high-quality movies, my hat is off to that guy. I think he's going to be directing films until the day he dies. Even in his hospital bed, he's probably going to be directing films. But let's hope that Clint Eastwood doesn't die (laughs) anytime soon. But the 1570 to Paris, will it be as good as Sully? I really couldn't say, but I will see it next week, and I will let you know what I think on next week's show. The other big movie that's coming out a little early, I might add, is Peter Rabbit. And this is a feature adaptation of Beatrix Potter's classic tale of a rebellious rabbit trying to sneak into a farmer's vegetable garden. I have no idea what this movie's going to be like. It is partly animation and part live action, that much I know. It stars James Corden... Faisal Bazi, I don't know who that is, Domhnall Gleeson, and the singer Sia. And I think Sia is probably going to be the voice of one of the characters because she is notorious for not showing her real face on any of her album covers or when she performs on TV or what have you. But the reason I say Peter Rabbit is coming out really early is because you associate a rabbit character, particularly one like Peter Rabbit, Beatrix Potter's character, with Easter. And not only is it not Easter yet, it's not even Ash Wednesday yet. That happens actually on February 14th. But that being said, I'm still looking forward to seeing Peter Rabbit. It's directed by Will Gluck, and Will Gluck has uh, directed films you wouldn't normally associate with somebody who's directing Peter Rabbit. He directed... Easy A, starring Emma Stone, which is probably her breakthrough role. Uh, Friends with Benefits, starring Mila Kunis and Justin Timberlake, which I didn't see, but I I heard mixed reviews about that. He also directed the controversial remake of Annie, starring Kuvenzani Wallace, Jamie Foxx, Rose Byrne, Bobby Cannavale, and Cameron Diaz. And this was the movie that effectively ended Cameron Diaz's career, or one of the movies that did, because we have not seen her in a movie since then, and it's been four years. So, how Will Gluck does with this movie, I hope it's more easy A and less Annie, but I can't say for sure. But either way, it's a movie that I will review for next week's show, and I will let you know what I think when I see it. But meanwhile, that about does it with that just about does it with this week's Words on Film. Again, you've been listening to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I am your host and movie critic Dan Burke. Just reminding you that Words on Film, the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of yours truly and are not necessarily reflective of any employees who are working at the station to which you are listening to this broadcast or the station as a whole. In other words, I have my opinion, the people who work...